Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, we have how to build a therapeutic rapport with clients and staff. Um, I will let the presenters um, introduce themselves to you here shortly, but my name is Danielle Daly. I'm the professional development coordinator here with the Illinois Crisis Prevention Network. Um, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping things and then I'll pass you on off to your presenters for the day. We will run until 2.15 today. Um, you are muted. I did see someone ask. Everyone's muted. Your cameras are disabled. Um, please use that chat box feature throughout. You can also use the Q&A one. I think it defaults to host and panelists. So if you want to make sure that um, everything you're saying is visible to people, make sure that you, you uh, change that to everyone. Um, please visit our website, icpn.org. We do have a couple upcoming trainings that are already on our website for August. We have one on August 13th, which is a little bit outside of our normal um, day and time because it is a Tuesday instead of a Wednesday. Um, but we have the Forgotten Factor Sensory Processing. Um, in August, be sure to check those out. You can also sign up to be on our mailing list. If you go to the top right-hand corner of the, the website, it says Join Mailing List. Um, continuing education certificates, um, they will come to the email address that you registered with. Um, I will tell you that last week I had told people that they would be out by the end of the week and then we had some technology issues. So if you do not receive yours from me by next week, then please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email address is ddaily at hope.us. I will also put that into the chat box so that you have it, but keep in mind, they will come to the email address that you registered with uh, by clicking on the link that you received. You are accounted for today um, and it keeps track of your attendance. So um, be on the lookout for that. I'm hoping to have them out by the end of the week. Um, if we have technology issues again, it may be next week, um, but next week, if you still do not have it from me, then please feel free to reach out. Um, I will put that information into the chat box, um, but I think we are ready to get started. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brianna Riley. I'm a licensed social worker, and I am with the Illinois Crisis Prevention Network with Support Services Team. And today I'm going to be talking about how to build a therapeutic report with clients. And my colleague, Michael Chandler, will be talking about how to build a therapeutic report with staff later on during our presentation. All right. So the evolution of the concept of the therapeutic alliance, right? Who introduced therapeutic relationships? I'm pretty sure everyone is very familiar with Sigmund Freud, right? In 1912. He outlined the concepts of transference and countertransference, which are the unconscious feelings or emotions that a patient feels towards their therapist and vice versa. Um, Carl Rogers in 1951, he highlighted the concept of unconditional positive regard, meaning offering compassion to people, even if they have done something wrong, right? So let's say for instance, you go to work, and you have a client, you know, that had a behavior and they spit on you, right? And then the next day you come in and you don't speak to that client. And I'm pretty sure the client is wondering like, you know, why is the staff not talking to me, right? But then at the same time, the staff is not having unconditional positive regard, right? They're not showing unconditional positive regard because we have to offer compassion to people even if they have done something wrong, right? Um, Lebersky. Um, in 1976, um, his perception was um, that there, the patient's perception of therapists as supportive and a second type more typical of later phases in the therapy represented the collaborative relationship between patient and therapist to overcome the patient's problem, um, a sharing of responsibility in working to achieve the goals of the therapy and a sense of communion, right, togetherness. Edward Borden in 1979, the other two components of the alliance can develop if there is a personal relationship of confidence and regard, since any agreement on goals and tasks requires the patient to believe in the therapist's ability to help him or her 
and the therapist in return must be confident in the patient's resources or the client's resources, right? Borden also suggests that the alliance will influence the outcome, not because it is healing in its own right, but as an ingredient which enables the patient to accept, follow, and believe in treatment. And I think that is huge, right? Our clients have to believe in us to be able to help them overcome the challenges that they face on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So... Now that we've discussed the evolution of the concept of the therapeutic alliance, we're going to talk about where we are now, right? So Stephen C. Hayes, I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with acceptance commitment therapy, right? Um, I think that it is very important to highlight what are some of our clients' deepest desires, right? Can anyone in the chat be able to just list some of those, right? What do you think are some of our clients' deepest desires? What are some of their values that they might have? Independence, absolutely. Family, love, right? Being loved, right? And knowing what that looks like as well, right? Marriage, yes, respect, right? All of that good stuff. And even having their own isola, right? Them wanting to live independently, going on vacation, right? Uh, being able to obtain a driver's license, maybe. Um, what do they value most, right? So it's our job to increase others around them about their deepest desires, because this can cause positive outcomes during treatment and also get them to stay on track towards their goals with their desires and their values, right? Um, in regards to DBT, um, Marsha in 1970, right? A fun fact about DBT is that it was for individuals who had borderline personality disorder or high or individuals who were highly suicidal, and they focused more on how to work through distressing experiences, which potentially created a positive outcome in behavioral treatment. Right, Aaron Beck in 1960 with cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, this therapy was utilized for individuals who suffered from depression and anxiety based on the psychological construct that individuals' interpretations of situations influence their reaction, emotionally, behaviorally, psychological, right? More so than the situation itself. Dr. Beck found that when he helped his patients evaluate and change their distorted thinking, they felt better and were able to modify their behavior, right? So if I tell myself, you know, I'm the worst clinician in the world, right? I'm eventually going to feel like that. <laughs> but if I tell myself, you know what? I'm the best clinician in the whole wide world. That is the result that I'm going to get, right? So I think that is also important to make sure that we have positive thinking, right? In situations like that with our clients. Um, Kohlenberg and Mavis, right? With FAP. Functional analytic psychotherapy uh, focuses more on clinical relevant behaviors, which is which are those CRB ones, right? Which are instances of patients' daily life problems that occur in session. Uh, and CRB twos, which are instances of patients' improvements that occur in session. So that may look like, you know, you might have a client who struggles with physical aggression and they might, you know, be in session. They say, you know, instead of me punching you know, Susie or Robert, you know, I just decided to walk away, right? So them to be self-aware of, you know, uh, making that change in regards to instead of engaging in that target behavior and, you know, using a coping skill to walk away, that is a CBR, CRB2, right? So the goal of FAP are to reduce the CRB1s, right, which are the challenges, and increase the CRB2s, which are the improvements, right, with the client. And that, in turn, is the vehicle of the therapeutic change um, and outcomes. So everyone entering the chat box. So what is the first thing that you do when you meet a new client? Okay, greeting them, introducing yourself. Okay, listen to next questions. Give them a compliment, okay. Ask about themselves. Okay. See what their room is like. Okay. 
Intro, small connect, listening. Okay. So I know some other ways, right? Or some other things that we can do when meeting a new client is doing icebreakers, right? That may look like playing Uno, right? Or getting the client to identify their interests, right? Ask about their family dynamics or modeling new me activities, right? That could look like coloring or blowing bubbles, right? Or that could look like you just observing them for the first time and getting some input and information from their team at that time, right? So some components of a therapeutic alliance. Um, what does this look like for the clients that we serve, right? Um, are some of those components uh, our agreement on goals, right? Collaborative goal setting, agreement on interventions, shared decision-making, what works, what doesn't work, effective bond between the client and the therapist or the clinician, right? With building that therapeutic relationship and trust. Um, availability, accessibility, and of course the outcome. Um, so what does this look like? Is this working on self-regulation, right? Identifying new me activities or new coping skills, learning how to establish healthy relationships and with others and knowing what that looks like and modeling what that looks like. Um, how do you know when both you and the client have agreed on goals and interventions, right? I know sometimes this is um, a little tough sometimes because most of the time I know that they have a treatment plan or an action plan, right, or a behavior plan that might be presented to them, but uh, were they actually collaboratively involved in that plan, right? Did they agree to the plan before it was even written, right? So what does that look like, right? Do they know what works best for them? Do they not know what works best for them? Um, sometimes there might be friction upon those goals or within the relationship at that point, right? Because it can, because, you know, this is being presented to them and they're like, wait, what? I had no idea about this. I'm not doing these things, right? Um, so sometimes we need to take a step back, right? And ask ourselves, why is this relationship stagnant? Let's go back to the drawing board. Did I present this information to my client? Did we both agree what goals he or she is working on? Is this person being forced to do something they do not want to do? Does my client feel like he is in control of his own treatment plan, right? And that is important because this can determine the outcome of treatment and the therapeutic alliance, right? So some of those agreement on goals right, can be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, right? So what does this look like for the clients that we serve, right? Identifying your client's goals with making them feel like they're a part of that process. Um, it's about the delivery with the therapeutic interventions. Are their goals achievable? Can they achieve these goals in a timely fashion, right? This is also where we incorporate the skill system, right? To help them stay on track towards their goals. Is this helpful or is this not helpful towards my goal? Right? So agreement on interventions, right? Validation, increasing their self-awareness about a behavior concern or a cognitive thought pattern. Sometimes role reversal or role playing a situation that our client cannot understand is helpful. I know that I use that very effectively with my clients. Um, in order to have a successful outcome in treatment, they have to agree with what will work and what will not work for them, right? I always tell my clients, I am here to... I'm not here to tell you what to do with your life, right? I am only here to assist you with how you navigate through life. And depending on what choice that you decide to make for yourself would have this particular outcome, right? So we never want to make our clients that we serve feel that we are trying to control them, right? All right, so my next, my next engagement with you guys are... What are two things you could ask someone um, to find out if they are trustworthy? I know that's a really tricky question. <laughs> what are two things you could ask someone to find out if they're trustworthy? 
Yes. What does trust mean to you, right? Do they value loyalty and honesty? Okay. Okay. Have you ever broken someone's trust and how did it make you feel? Okay. Do you have friends? Okay. Yes, it definitely does take time, right? Building trust with your client and for your client to trust you, it does take time. What does trust mean to you? Yes. You have rules and boundaries. Okay. Yes. All of you guys' answers are awesome, right? Find out what this means from your client, right? And also define what this means to you, right? Because then both of you will have a great understanding of your own um, definition, right, of trust. Identify traits uh, that make someone trustworthy, right? What makes trust important and valuable to them, right? So... The next thing I'm going to talk about is cultural competence. I think this one is huge, right? Um, so I kind of broke this down to, you know, just a couple different components, right? The cognitive component of cultural competence involves deepening knowledge about different cultures, worldviews, belief systems, history, traditions, practice, and language, right? This includes understanding how cultural influences behavior, attitudes towards healthcare services, education, et cetera, right? The effective component involves developing empathy for individuals from different cultures by recognizing and respecting their perspectives without imposing our own beliefs, right? So I feel like sometimes that could cause friction in treatment because we, the client might want to, you know, increase their independence, right? But their cultural, right, aspects may not really give them the full ability to do that, right? So we have to take that into consideration, right? Um the behavior component involves adapting one's communication style based on the specific context of interaction, right? Showing interest in what others have to say, being aware of power dynamics between different groups, and so on, right? So this includes respecting boundaries within which individuals feel comfortable, expressing themselves easily, and also being able to relate to your client as well, right? That's that's important. All right. So when it comes to availability and setting boundaries, right, I want everyone to ask themselves, do you make yourself available for the clients that you serve? Do you set boundaries for the clients that you serve, right? Are you committed to making yourself available to your clients? I always tell my clients, I'm available between the hours of 8.30 and 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. If I do not answer my phone, that means I'm with the client. And if you leave me a message, I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible, right? So I'm kind of giving them like some reassurance and validation, right? That if I'm not answering, this is the reason why, right? By also setting a boundary by saying, hey, I'm not going to be available after five or on the weekends, right? I don't know, you know, um, that's just for me specifically, you know, I can't speak for everyone because everyone's schedule is different, right? But just give an example, right? Does your client feel comfortable reaching out to you during a crisis, right? So for me, I tell my clients, if you reach me outside of work hours, leave a voicemail, I'll get back to you, right? Um, but having your client have the ability to reach out to you during a crisis is huge, right? That shows the type of report that you are establishing with your client, that your client trusts you enough to say, hey, I need to call this person because I know they can help me calm down in this, you know, challenging moment that I'm currently having, right? Do you show up for your client when they are currently in crisis? I think that is another huge piece, right? Sometimes we tell our clients, hey, you know, if this happens, just let me know. And then if the client let you know, and then you let them down, right, that can actually damage the therapeutic alliance. And it can actually, you know, discourage them from reaching out when they are currently in crisis too, right? So for the therapist, as far as outcomes with the therapeutic alliance, um, some researchers have even began to argue that the quality of the alliance is more important than the type of treatment in predicting positive therapeutic outcomes, such that the therapeutic alliance has been referred to as the 
quite essential integrative variable of therapy, right? So be ready to say no if you feel unable to work with a particular client. For example, I know I have a client who worked with uh, an ISC that was a part of our team and he had a crush on her and she could no longer be a part of our team because of that, right? So sometimes for us as clinicians and staff, we have to also know when to say no, right? To be able to determine a therapeutic alliance and what that outcome and treatment may look like, right? Discuss with a colleague or a supervisor any feelings you need to sideline to be successful with their client. Hey, you know, I feel like I'm stagnant with this particular client. You know, I kind of feel like I really don't know what to do next, right? Going to your supervisor to be able to talk to them about these things are also huge and very important. Um, although it is clear from the Therapeutic Alliance literature that the strength of the alliance is related to treated treatment outcome, there is evidence that many therapists fail to focus on the therapeutic relationship in session. So sometimes I know we use a lot of, you know, theories concept in therapy, right? But sometimes it's great to actually be in the moment and focus on uh, building that relationship in session, right? Then focusing more on that, right? For clients or the individuals that we serve, um, you know, educate clients with understanding that it is okay to discuss the challenges that they face on a day-to-day -day basis because we are there for them during those challenging times, right? That is how you also build a rapport with your client and trust because they can trust you during those challenging times to be there for them right? How are we making the clients we serve have a good quality of life? I think that is also very important. Are their needs not getting met, right? And because of if their needs aren't getting met, that can also cause us, you know, an increase in behaviors, right? Um, the client has the capacity and willingness to be open and honest to receive the help. Was anything in the session particularly unhelpful or annoying, right? What would you like to see more of or less of in future sessions, right? I think us getting feedback as clinicians as well can be helpful in having a positive therapeutic alliance outcome as well. All right, I am now going to shift over to Mr. Michael. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Chandler. I am with the Illinois Crisis Prevention Network, and I'm a behavior specialist. Uh, we're going to talk about staff relationships, okay? So introduce yourself to the staff and to the clients. Uh, somehow or another, you want to make sure that the clients know that you're there to help them, okay? and listen to them. Let them know that you're there to understand whatever it is they're encountering. So in other words, meet them where they are. Um, and staff, they have a very challenging job, as we all know, but sometimes they just need to feel supported. So if you can, ask staff about the client, like their behaviors, habits, preferences, what does your client look forward to, okay? So in the chat box, um, what do some of your clients or staff look forward to when they come to work? Where does your client like to go? So for example, um, I recall working with um, the staff and I had asked them, hey, let's make sure I'm understanding you correctly. So. John, of course, he likes his breakfast, but he prefers a hot breakfast over cold breakfast. So, set up parameters. So ask staff, where does your client like to go? So feel free in the chat box, is chat active? See here. Outings, cool. Walks, awesome. Bowling, oh, I love that. Ball games. Gambling, really? 
Nice. Museums, love it. Laser tag, horse races, you all go everywhere. Bingo, concerts. Oh, nice. Swimming, cool. Fishing, love it. Concerts. Spa days. Oh, you all have fun. I need to uh, tag along with you all to see where you're going, see what you're doing. Nature walks, awesome, which doesn't really cost any money. Bus rides, movies. Oh, proms, nice. Nice, these are great responses. Thank you all. Outings, bas baseball, basketball, rodeos. Love that. To the pool, yeah. Fishing, love it. Star clients, they like to do everything that anyone else would love to do. I love it. I love it. Thank you for your responses. Is it downtown, I, I love it. These are awesome. I get ideas from your ideas, okay? Frozen yogurt, love it. Skating, wow. I need to go skating. It's a little bit soft. Great responses, thank you, thank you all. And let them know what's to be expected of staff. Sometimes, you know, when you explain to them, hey, I'm here to help you, let them know, explain it to them. Referral and linkage to necessary supports, that's what we do. So we make it easier for them. So we we'll always try and keep in mind to partner up with staff to let them know you're there to help them, okay? We're there for data collection and assessment of challenging behaviors, but we're also here to help you. There's something that we can do to help provide assistance. Training and skill building for all parties in crisis intervention. Hey, be there to help them, okay? Remind them that you are there to support them by being, if it's whatever, however they see it, if it's shoulder to shoulder, uh, it's a partnership, okay? Find out how their schedules look and offer to assist with the schedule for the client. Sometimes that can be an area of improvement somewhere where they might not see it, but you have the insight to help them along with that. Ask them if they have someone to debrief with. That's very important. Interact with staff members. Communication is key to a successful relationship, okay? So ask staff members how long they've been there. Some staff have been there for, for a while, like for years. It's important that you know that and value their, um, their input. Model activities that the staff can actually do with the clients. Availability, collaborate with the staff, okay? When they know you're there to help them and you kind of unveil yourself to them, they'll be willing to work with you more. Uh, my director calls it money in the bank, okay? So how can we work together? And sometimes you have to build that trust. All right, now we'll go over to uh, Maslow. Dr. Maslow, the guy you see here in the picture photograph, um, he was um, one of the founders of the hierarchy of needs. Um, so in 1943, Psychology Review, Maslow's work was foundational to positive psychology. Assessing the client's needs, basic needs, safety needs, and psychological needs. This graphic on the left here is actually back from, um, from Maslow's era. Um, if you look at the color and the way it's all put together, but from there we'll spin off and we'll go to Martin Seligman. So in this particular um, model, we call it the PERMA model, okay? The PERMA model, consists of positive emotions, engagements, relationships, 
positive that is, meaning, and then accomplishments. The relationships piece, that's where um, the focus is on staff. You know, we want positive relationships with staff, which in turn goes over to the clients as well. And remember, all humans like to feel connected. They like to be seen, they like to be heard and loved. They need a feeling of belongingness, esteem, self-fulfillment needs as well. Now guys, I know some guys might have an issue with this, but in time, I'm referring to myself that is, I got to where I finally understood what this meant. The sense of belongingness, you wanna be a part of a team. The so staff wants to be a part of the care team for the individual as well. Okay. Speaking of places to go, I took um, my clients. We went to a firehouse and we made this an activity. It was out in the community. So keep in mind with the staff members uh, as well as the clients, self-efficacy, optimism, empowerment, self-esteem and belongingness, which is what we just covered. Very important. Everyone wants to feel connected. So engagement with the client and staff could consist of an activity. And several of you all have already named off. Those are great. Thank you for the input. And here we're at the library in one particular photo. And then this is a silk screening activity and then Gardening as well, and another client out gardening. So take the client out to the community, the library, or showing an interest in what they like. And here are my references. And thank you all for allowing us to present today. Really appreciate it. Back to you, Danielle. All right, Brianna, did you have any um, lasting um, remarks? Lasting remark? um, first, I kind of like wanted to like open up the chat for questions. Okay. First. Oh, I hear an echo. Um, I guess I just wanted to, to thank you guys um, for presenting today. I think it's important when we're talking about building a therapeutic um, environment um, for our clients, but also for our staff, right? So, you know, we're being conscious of the social environment. So the peers that, um, you know, that our individuals are, are, are with on a day-to-day -day basis, how staff are interacting with those peers, um, you know, the psychological environment. So, how we're communicating respect to the individuals that we're working with, um, whether that's, you know, teaching respect between our the peers within a home or within a day program. Um, another thing that I just wanted to point out was um, setting setting yourself up for success when we are entering into um, a therapeutic alliance with, with the people that we serve, right? So um, ensuring that we are, you know, happy and calm and excited to be working with them. I think that that models great interactions for, um, for everyone in the environment. Um, you know, there's been research on the five to one rule. So making sure that we have five positive interactions um, for every one negative interaction. And that negative interaction is not necess necessarily like a disciplinary action. It's more of um, even providing a demand or a request. Um, that's what we can consider, you know, a negative interaction. So making sure that we're really amping up the, those positive interactions um, to, to account for, for those negative interactions that happen um, in daily life at, that are inevitable, right? Um, let's check in the chat box a little bit here. Um, Brittany had said that she was kind of hoping that you guys could touch maybe a little bit on um, how DSPs can build more of a therapeutic relationship with their individuals that they're working with. Okay. Um, so I feel like when it comes to DSPs, like you guys are the ones that are spending the most time with clients, right? So um, I know when I used to work as a DSP, something that was very helpful was like engagement, 
right? Engagement with the clients, right? So that may look like us eating lunch together, right? Um, that might look like everyone playing musical chairs or like doing the cha-cha slide or um, everyone playing a game, right? But everyone is interactive. So like in those engagement activities, everyone is able to get a different outlook on, you know, what that individual may like, things that they may not like, um, just talking about like different group discussions, like, you know, for example, we might talk about bullying, right? Like just all the clients and they may be able to share. Some of them may not be able to share like their own experiences about that. But I feel like in order to have a great relationship with the client that you guys have to um, engage a lot with the client. Um, Heidi asked if there was any assessments that can be done to help gauge what is important to the people that we work with. Um, I'll probably just, hmm, an assessment to identify their interests and what they like. Yeah, and I was thinking too, like preference assessments are great because it does, you know, provide some insight into, um, you know, what is important. And I think just having those natural conversations with clients about their values, right? Um, oftentimes I feel like, um, you know, you can read a social history on a person, um, but unless we're having that direct conversation with someone about what they value and what they are interested in, um, you know, it can be hard at times where you have, when you have individuals who may be, um, let's say nonverbal, but that doesn't mean that we can't be trying things out to kind of gauge their interest in things. So I think starting with a preference assessment, a preference assessment is really, is really a good, um, good way to start, right? Um, it's Sue said we use satisfaction surveys, which explore areas of interest. Um, there definitely are other um, assessments and questionnaires available. Um, yeah, but just learning about what the person likes. Let's see. What else? What is a good way to address a client who develops a crush and oversteps boundaries with you while still maintaining positive rapport? Um, so I think that, you know, the first thing that definitely should be done is, you know, you know, having a conversation with the team, right? Um, I don't know if this is just like a, like, uh, just maybe like a therapist or, you know, a supervisor, like, you know, the whole team um, about what's going on um, in regards to what the client is displaying. Um, then the client that, you know, does have a crush on a particular staff, I think that the staff should have a conversation with the client, you know, and kind of uh, set boundaries in regards to what the client may be displaying. You know, I don't know like the details of what that may look like, um, but still being able to set boundaries and also help the client identify what's appropriate and what's not appropriate could be very helpful in that situation. Heather talked about how um, they use circles. So that's a curriculum that's widely used to talk about boundaries. Um, you know, it often requires some redirection and reminders of those boundaries. Um, Milana asks, what do you do to overcome objections when a client refuses to participate in a preferred activity, even if it is something that you know that they enjoy? Hmm. Well, we kind of have to meet the client where they're at, right? Like, even though that we know this is something that they enjoy, but they don't want that's not something they want to engage in at that time. Maybe we can encourage them to maybe join next time because we don't want to cause a behavior, right? And force the client to be able to, you know, participate in an activity that, you know, that we know that they like, but maybe also maybe doing something else that they would prefer to do in that moment, right? Yeah, I think you pointed out a good thing about avoiding power struggles, right? Um, and to keep in mind, you know, preferences change, right? I might like one thing one day and not like it the next day. Um, so always being conscious of that. And like you said, meeting that person where they're at, offer an alternative activity. Um, you know, individuals do have that right to choose what they engage in and what they don't engage in. 
Uh, Charity asks, how should you have the conversation with a staff member that does not have a therapeutic approach? So I would uh, encourage the staff member to talk to other members of the staff, um, probably a more senior staff member. And then perhaps from there, they can build a, a better relationship. Because sometimes the senior staff can teach the younger staff or the newer staff. Yeah, and I think it's Im important to note too, right, um, that they might not understand what a therapeutic relationship is and they might not have um you know the skills and maybe that's something that can be taught right so that's where the training piece comes in you know where we're training staff members on and how to build that therapeutic alliance with clients and i think it's a good point to remind them of the importance of that therapeutic alliance in that um you know when you do have a great therapeutic alliance with your clients um you're not going to have as many behaviors right you're going to be able to um, provide better redirection. So it in turn helps helps you out as well. Um, but like you said, I like the idea of, um, you know, sometimes getting a senior staff involved. Maybe it's pairing with another staff member to understand how they work with, with clients because um, that can always be helpful, right? To see it and have someone model it to us that helps us, helps us learn how to engage better with people. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, Amy, Amy had a good comment um, about engaging in preferred activities. She said, I think sometimes that it's when it's known that it's an individual, that, that an individual likes a certain activity, that's the activity that's offered to them all the time, right? We're not providing them with a variety of activities. So, you know, at some point you kind of get sick of doing the same thing, right? So maybe that doesn't become a preferred anymore. All right. People are asking about the handouts. I did send the presentation out earlier today. Um, it was probably about 10 a.m. ish. Um, if you did not receive that, please shoot me an email. Um, I did have some that kicked back. There are some servers that for some reason don't like me to send stuff to them. Um, so if you didn't uh, receive that, you feel free to email me. I can send that directly to you. Heather, you know, Heather pointed out you can define what therapeutic is to that staff member. Some staff have different interpretations or um, or a lack thereof. Tracy recommended um, observing staff and offering corrective feedback in the moment while working with individuals. Pair with veteran staff. I agree, R Ramon. Um, therapeutic training would be super beneficial to be incorporated in any part of staff training. Lisa um, mentioned that some staff interpret boundaries different. Um, absolutely, right? Um, and that comes down to when we talk about um, consistency, um, that's where some issues can occur with individuals, right? If they're, um, they have different boundaries with different staff, that can create a whole lot of issues um, because they expect a certain thing with one staff member and probably expect that with the next staff member that comes in. So that can create some issues. So um, definitely a team approach on that, right? Uh, making sure that everyone is on the same page. Oh, that's Leroy. a good one, Lisa. <laughs> Leroy uh, pointed out that it is important to build trust. Um, yeah, Layla, we are all different when it comes to what is therapeutic, right? Um, and I think that that goes back to the the point of um, ensuring that we're understanding the clients that we're working with, because then we can build a relationship with them um, that is therapeutic for them. Um, each person is going to be different. Different. Each person has um, different trauma that comes into play, um, and that's going to impact the, the therapeutic alliance that you create with that person. Um, but again, yes, keeping in mind, um, we are all different. We all do in like different things. Um, so making sure that we are paying attention to how we can be, be um, the most person-centered. Rapport is very important, especially after a behavior may have occurred. Absolutely, Jan. 
Heather pointed out too, that we want to make sure that boundaries are taught and consistent across all environments. Um, and consistency, I mean, we preach that all the time, consistency, consistency. Um, that's what's going to be most beneficial, especially when we're dealing with difficult behaviors. That's sometimes a challenge. <laughs> Absolutely. That's Absolutely. Dusty, yeah. Dusty says, I like to remind everyone of our common goal for our client to be happy, healthy, and safe. That's wonderful, Dusty. Train and retrain staff regularly. Um, staff drift over time as and residents change. Absolutely. In between trainings, um, give a lot of po possible feedback to continue to build trust with staff. Uh, and I think that's something that we all have experienced, right? Um, you know, definitely with the staffing shortage, shortages um, and staff leaving, um, there's a, a lot of training that needs to be done and continue to be done. Um, let's see, trying to make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, and I think that also goes into when we do have, you know, staff, a lot of staff turnover or a lot of staff coming in and out that the client has to, you know, kind of rebuild that report all over again. And sometimes for clients that might be, you know, a smooth process, but for others, it might be a little bit challenging, right? So I think that is also important to take into consideration as well. Lori corrected me that it, it was supposed to be um, positive feedback, not not a possible feedback. So thank you, Lori, oh. for verifying that for me. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I, I thought that would probably be what it was, but I didn't want to <laughs> not read it correctly. So um, uh, Ramon said, said <laughs> set real, I love the laughing emoji, emoji. Right. Um, <laughs> set realistic goals and periodically check um, for progress or lack thereof. Yeah. Just checking through the chat box to make sure that we've gotten everyone's questions and comments. Um, you know, like someone had pointed out, this is a good reminder for everyone. Um, Ruth asked, how do you get any feedback from clients about therapeutic relationship? Well, first we have to define like from the client's perspective about like what is their definition of a therapeutic relationship or how do they define like a healthy relationship with someone, right? Um, I know in most cases, the clients that we serve really don't have a lot of stable, healthy relationships with others, including family, right? So I think that um, the first step would be to, you know, kind of ask the clients to define that or even know like what that is, what does that look like for them? And then also, you know, um, getting feedback from that client in regards to what would they hope for that to look like for them in their own lives about that relationship. And I think it's also reasonable to ask, you know, our clients for um, for feedback on, on anything, any sort of interaction that we're having, like, you know, staff asking, you know, how can, how can I improve on our relationship? Um, because oftentimes, you know, there could be situations where someone doesn't want to speak up about how um, they interpret the relationship being. Um, so making sure that, you know, we're asking, you know, what can I improve upon to, to ensure that we have a good relationship and we, you know, you know, I'm able to make you feel um, safe and happy, um, you know, almost like, feel like you're kind of opening like a complaint box, but those are the important things that we need, right? For right. feedback in any sort of relationship that we're having, open lines of communication. And I think um, once you kind of start that, you'll realize that the relationship gets easier between some, between two people, right? If you have that open line of communication and you're, they're able to say like, I, I don't like it when you speak in this tone or anything like that, they're able to give you that feedback. So you can take that and correct that and ensure that you're working with that person the way that they would like to be worked with. All right, I am not seeing anything else. 
So we will go ahead and let, oh, hang on. There's some people that are raising their hands. If you are raising your hands, sometimes I know it happens on accident. Um, if not, please please feel free to, to type in the chat box or that Q&A. Um, like I said, slides were sent out this morning. However, um, I know that I did get some um, return to senders um, from some certain from certain servers. So if that's the case, you did not receive it, obviously check your spam first because I know sometimes my stuff goes to spam. Um, if not, send me an email. Um, I'll type that into the, the chat box right now so that you guys have it. Um, certificates will be sent out. Um, I'm hoping by the end of the week, like I said, technology did not work out last week and um, they got sent out a little bit later than I anticipated. So if you don't receive that by the middle of next week, then feel free to reach out to me. It will come to the email address that you registered with. Um, but I think that is all we have for today. So thank you so much, Brianna and Michael for presenting. And um, thank you everyone for joining us. And I hope that everyone has a great rest of your day. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.